I um, I'm going to discuss with you today the physician of the future and the future of physicians. And I would like to start by telling you that in 1990, I developed and started laparoscopic surgery in West Virginia. And it was very shortly after that that I realized that I had stepped into a different dimension, one that had altered forever the present and the future of medicine and of surgery in particular. And now I think that we are in a similar situation where the, the 30 years that have almost passed are taking us to a transitional moment which we will need to be aware of and discuss to decide how we're going to uh, plan the rest of our professional career. The, if, if you remember Arthur, Arthur Schopenhauer who said that all truth path, passes through three stages, first is ridiculed, second is violently opposed, and then is accepted as being self-evident, that is a truth that remains the same today as it was then. If you lived in Babylon 2,000 years ago and you um, uh, took ill, you will then go to the square of the sick. And everyone that passed by would tell you how to cure themselves. And doing that simple uh, thing, the Babylon citizens had the longest life expectancy in the world. Biology, which is essential to our profession, is changing because it's now is being influenced, influenced by many of the sciences, including mathematics, genetics, physics, and, and others. And so now, biology in that uh, uh, context should be called biological data science. So I would like to make a, comment, a couple of comments about medical students. Medical education is changing. How is it changing? It's changing significantly because we already have the AMA reporting for several years in the long-term planning and development of medical students. Many of the schools in the country are already in, involved in this uh, changes that the medical students are going to see very quickly. And some of the, uh, of the changes that are taking place include the possibility of creating an accelerated graduation, such as it happens already in the Medical College of Wisconsin in, in, the, in NYU Medical School. And the main elements of the curricula include an early clinical experience, uh, a knowledge of patients, uh, patients' safety and quality improvement, team-based care, and population-based care. All of this is based on wireless technology and 3D printing of patient organs in virtual reality and in the projection of holograms. So that is coupled with the fact that many of the facilities that are being erected at this point have these uh, um, elements in place, such as Duke University, or Nebraska, which uses virtual reality and teleeducation to teach the medical students, as well as University of North Dakota and others. So I want to show you, in this case, for instance, how the students are, in many of these schools, already taught anatomy without the use of cadavers. So let me show you this slide. And exactly understand where things sit. You can take any anatomical translucent so you can see through the outside and that I actually had a moment where I found the aortic valve and it was the first time that I'd actually seen the aortic valve. I also would like to mention a couple of words about hospitals. The first thing that is important to keep in mind is the assistance of computing solutions in medical decisions is imminent, is inevitable. The hospital of the future is going to be one that takes care of patients that have trauma, 
and that require intensive care. And the important thing is that the ideal hospital of the future will be the patient's own home, which will be uh, done using monitors that the patients will have in their house, and the advice will come from virtual providers through telemedicine. The hospital of the future is unquestionably going to be driven by technology, and the goal is to enhance the healthy. Today, we manage illness. Tomorrow, we are thinking about creating health. So let me tell you about the physician of the future. What is happening around us? The first thing that we know is that healthcare jobs are moving out of hospitals. And in fact, it is predicted that by the year 2024, we will see a significant decrease in the number of healthcare jobs that are today based in the hospital. The traditionally compliant patient, which is what we see today, is changing into a well-informed medical shopper. And the patients will be able to control their health care using genomic information which they will obtain through nanosensors that they will have at home. The key is going to be prevention, prevention of disease. So the role of the physician of the future is changing because the role of the patient of the future is changing. And that means that we will see a surge in physician employment to uh, particularly improve quality. We will see a promotion of prevention and we will see that the rewards to providers is going to be based on keeping people out of the hospital, meaning caring for people at home. The care will be delivered remotely by telemedicine, as we mentioned, and healthcare in many cases will evolve into education. For instance, if you have diabetes or a heart condition, you will come home and a e-tutor will teach you how to deal with the disease, whichever that disease might be. Payment is going to change. The payment is going to be for value and for quality. In other words, what that means is that eventually payment is going to be given when the patients do well. If the patients don't do well, the providers will not get paid. So how will the role of the physicians change? Currently, we see the physician as an authority, and it has been that way for a long time. The physician of the future is going to change and become a team member. He's going to be first a facilitator and then a team member, a member of a cyber team which will be looking after people's health. And this cyber team will be a team with multiple health providers. What does the physician of the future need to remain relevant and competitive? It is exceeding, exceedingly important that the physician will remain an absolutely perfect social and, uh, and skillful communicator. So social and communication skills are essential, plus the fact that they will have to have a commitment to lifelong learning and to information management. So what should the physician of the future know? The first thing that he, is going to, he or she is going to have to deal with is an avalanche of data. The information technologies of all kinds is doubling almost every year. And if you remember what one terabyte is, which is, is the same as a thousand gigabytes, so if you think in terms of an example, the Library of Congress contains 15 terabytes. One zettabyte is the same as one trillion gigabytes. So the total amount of data in the world in the year 2013 was 4.4 zettabytes. It is predicted that the total amount of zettabytes in 2020 is going to be 10 times that amount, 44 zettabytes. 
In 2017, humans generated more than 16 trillion gigabytes of digital data. And it is being predicted that in, by 2020, the increase in annual data is going to be in the range of 4,300%. The sheer volume of knowledge today is beyond anybody's capacity for memorization. The academic literature is already a bottleneck. For instance, we know that there are already 50 million research papers published, and they are growing at a rate of 1 million papers a year, which is a way in which no one can possibly keep up. How are we going to deal with this problem? We are going to use smart data. So the software that is already being developed will allow us to answer data or questions that are needed and not dwell into the numerous questions that are being proposed or asked at the same time. If we can uh, do that, healthcare could save as much as $300 billion a year. And information is already being stored in a nanostructure glass disk the size of a quarter that can hold 360 terabytes of data with a shelf life of 13.8 billion years, the age of the universe. We are thinking that machines could start thinking like humans as early as 2025. So sensors are going to be an integral part of our profession. Everybody's familiar with these sensors, the thermometer, the stethoscope, the blood pressure cuff, and so on. The nanosensors are going to be the future of diagnostic medicine because they have high accuracy and specificity and they are not expensive. There are already sensors in place. I will just show you some examples, like this one, which allows you to measure electrolytes, glucose, kidney function, this which allows you to, um, to monitor the size of a, uh, an aneurysm, sensors that can give us EKGs, EEGs, EMGs, and so on and so forth. Uh, Google is producing a smart contact lens which will not only be able to measure the glucose, but it will be able to deliver drugs as well. There are already watches, smart watches, that tell us what the uh, cardiac arrhythmia that a patient might have is. There are graphene sensors that can detect DNA from somebody with HIV. And there are wearable underwear with 3D motion sensors that can detect falls and call for help when the patient does fall. It is expected that by 2022, just a few years down the line, wearable nanosensors are expected to exceed the market in the range of $15 billion a year. Cancer is going to be detected by liquid biopsies, and that is already happening. And that means that we will be able to identify molecular alterations that will tell us what the cancer that the patient has is. And it has already been done. The, the, the fact has already been proven that we can detect one cancer molecule detected among 10,000 normal ones. So the sensors and your cell phone will identify the first cancer cell in the bloodstream. There's already a, cancer, a blood cancer test that allows us to detect several solid tumors like ovary, pancreas, esophagus, and so on. And that is about 82% efficient right now. This will continue to evolve, and eventually we will see something like this to be 100% efficient. The treatment of cancer is going to check. It's going to change because we will see the disappearance of chemotherapy and the appearance of immunotherapy instead. There is already a very interesting study that was published at the beginning of uh, 2018 where the injection of a uh, immune immunotherapy uh, drug into the primary tumor in animals that had metastatic disease made both the primary tumor disappear 
and the metastatic disease as well. Artificial intelligence is uh, advancing at very rapid pace. Many of you might remember the Jeopardy game in which the um, computer, Watson from IBM, beat these two champions. And this happened in 2011. Watson is now being used by 13 to 14 institutions in the country to help them detect cancer of diff different types. And Watson can uh, read and interpret information from a million books and, and thousands of other uh, pieces of information in about three seconds. And so far, it has been able to identify the treatment that has not been seen by doctors in 30% of cancer patients. However, Watson is not ready for prime time. It is not yet what was expected to be, but it will continue to evolve. The market for artificial intelligence in healthcare is projected to grow by 40% a year to approximately $6.6 .6 billion in 2021. And it will be 15 trillion dollars by 2030, and that means globally, of course. Changes brought by artificial intelligence can be expected to result, however, in about 38% of the jobs in the U.S. replaced by artificial intelligence robots, robots over the next 15 years. And the first jobs that might disappear are those jobs that are low skill. And that might very well happen in the next 20 years. And in medicine, what will happen is that we will see the disappearance of some of the specialties that are based on repetition, such as diagnostic radiology, pathology, dermatology, and then others. But at the beginning, there will be a combination of the physician with the artificial intelligent machine to help them out, but eventually that will not be the case. There are already algorithms that allows, that allows us to this diagnose skin cancer by telemedicine, and that is uh, one of the examples that I'm showing you at Stanford University. San Francisco already has two restaurants where there are no servers, no cashiers, no people employed. The reverse engineering of the brain is happening at a very fast pace as well. The, the brain, which is called the central source of the templates of intelligence. A quadriplegic has been able to move his fingers after the implantation of a chip in his brain. And this will show you an example of that. But what's happening now is that scientists are connecting uh, that brain probe to electrodes in people's arms or legs and allowing them to move their limbs again using their thoughts. This is another example of what is happening with telekinesis. In other words, the ability to move objects by thoughts with external sensors. Let me show you this movie. turns right and left, moves up and down, and even flies through a ring, all on commands. It is important to keep in mind that prosthetics are advancing at a very fast pace as well. For instance, a new nerve interface can give a prosthetic limb a sense of touch, something that had not happened before. So let me show you how this can happen. Sensors onto artificial skin are allowing prosthetic feeling, and that is advancing also very rapidly. This shows you how a double amputee can manage uh, uh, artificial limbs simply with the power of his thoughts.
Carnegie Mellon, for instance, has invested $12 million into artificial intelligence to reverse engineer the brain. And it is predicted that perhaps by the year 2030 or 2035, we will be able to see the reverse engineering of the human brain in significant uh, manner. Let me tell you a little bit about Equalisuak. Equalisuak is the Kalalisut name, which is the West Greenlandic dialogue, dialect of the Greenland shark. The Greenland shark has been seen to live to the, to, for at least 512 years. There is a jellyfish, Turritopsis dornhi, that is immortal. There is a hydra, which has been in our planet for about 600, year, 600 million years, which is immortal. There is a bacterium, the Enococcus radiodurans, that can resist vacuum, that can resist battery acid, and that can resist 1.5 million rats and survive. There is a kin cricket or wetaback that is immortal. And Google founded in the year 2013 a company called Calico, which was interested in halting aging. What happened to life expectancy? We went from living 18 years when we were in the Cro-Magnon era to living 78 years in 2002. So what will happen to life expectancy? Look at what is going to happen with centenarians. In the year 2020, we expect to see 214,000 centenarians. In the year 2050, we will see 834,000 of them. And in the world, we will see 3.7 million centenarians, which means that all of you will be taking care of patients that are much older, much older than the patients that we used to take care of before. National Geographic found common features of the lifestyles of people living in their 100s, and they found that everybody answered the same thing. Good diet, lots of sex. If you think that sex doesn't exist in the 80s, think again. Wine, naps, and movement. It is predicted that today, one in four 65-year-olds will live past age 90, and one in 10 will live past age 95. So today, we increase our lifespan by three months every year, and it is predicted that by the, by the year 2036, lifespan will increase one year every year. Why does it matter? It matters because it is predicted that the aging process may be reversible. And that is through manipulation of life, lifespan regulating genes. If you manipulate some of the genes that we're aware of, like uh, RNA polymerase 3, which is common in humans, you can extend the lifespan of flies and worms. Resveratrol, which is contained in wine, can revitalize all cells and increase lifestyle, lifespan. A molecule that is given to mice can reduce the signs of aging very significantly to the tune of maybe increasing their lifespan, their lifespan by 17 to 42 percent. And basically the treatment slows the age-related changes, which is what we're interested in right now, which is cancer formation, cataract formation, osteoarthritis, and so on. Implanted cells, stem cells, can develop fresh neurons, and this has been done at Albert Einstein in New York. And it has been seen that that slows the aging for months, and the life is extended by 10 to 15%. Let me tell you a little bit about regenerative medicine. Lizards can regrow tails, and that offers an insight into the human regenerative medicine. So let me show you this movie.
This video will uh, give you the example of the regeneration of a digit. Let's take a look. The pig's bladder is cheap and easily available. Put it where you're injured. Lee wasn't sure what the mysterious powder was, but he trusted his brother. His entire fingertip miraculously regrew. This uh, gives you an example of zebrafish. Zebrafish can regenerate cardiac, liver, brain, hematopoietic regeneration, and just about anything that is injured. In this regeneration movie of tail fins, each frame that you are looking at represents only 24 hours of regenerative growth. Now we add ZF143 to this equation. What we see is that the defect in regeneration is corrected. Stem cell therapy can also be used for craniofacial bone repair and it has been done as far back as 2012, as you can see here. The uh, corneas can be regrown using stem cells and this has been done in mice. And just recently, a very interesting uh, experiment has been done which is called tissue nanotransfection. That's been, this has been done in Ohio State, where you can basically touch a, a uh, chip that has uh, the DNA that you decide you want to use. And that uh, simple um, uh, element can create and regenerate any organ that the patient might need, including kidney, blood vessels, and so on and so forth. Exoskeletons are moving very rapidly and Harvard, for instance, has developed a very lightweight exoskeleton that can assist patients with normal gait. And there are already many places in the country, including our hospital here, that uses this kind of exoskeleton to help paralyzed patients to walk. And it is expected that many of these exoskeletons can create in, uh, very interesting situations in the future. Robotics has been in place since 2012, and that continues to improve every year. You, hear, you, you see here, for instance, a robotic arm lifting a patient from her bed to a wheelchair in a nursing home. You see a robot, a robot in China uh, preparing noodles, a robot in China serving customers, and a robot in Tokyo playing the violin, which tells you how sophisticated the software created is. I want to show you um, a movie of the most current robots, and this will give you an idea of the sophistication that we are going to be seeing in these robots. Some companies are already um, are looking into the use of robots to improve their situation. Samsung, for instance, has 40,000 software engineers. The industrial sales of robots increased significantly since 2009 and it is expected to continue to, to, to soar. China has already a couple of factories where they are using robots to do the uh, job that the, the humans were doing before. For instance, this example that I'm showing you is a factory that had 660 60 employees, and now this is down to 60 employees. And it is predicted that by the year 2030, there might be 800 million global jobs lost to automation. Surgery is also going to suffer a significant change. There 
has already been a uh, robot, an artificial intelligent intelligence doing an anastomosis of the intestine. This is in the laboratory, and this was done in 2016. In China, in 2017, a robot carried the first fully automated dental implant, and the FDA already has approved a dental system to uh, perform surgery, and the statistics are showing that the precision with which these robots are doing surgery is greater than that uh, obtained by surgeons. Eye surgery has been done by robots, and there are already, in, uh, there are already companies that are uh, teaching uh, anyone that wants to become uh, interested in this situation to do surgery using uh, uh, digital um, uh, maneuvers. Some of the residents in this country already have these uh, programs from, from touch surgery, including Harvard, Cleveland Clinic, Mount Sinai, and others. So the predictions are saying that the future of surgery is going to be robotic, data-driven, and artificially intelligent. Gene therapy is advancing very rapidly. You remember severe combined immunodeficiency, and this is a patient that everybody is aware of, that uh, his name was David Vetter, and he basically was placed in a, in a bubble that kept him from being infected with bacteria, and he lived to age uh, 12. Most of those patients didn't live past year one or two. And they now survive with gene therapy. Gene therapy can reverse sight loss, can reverse blindness, blindness by injecting the retina. And let me show you what we are talking about when we talk about gene therapy. We're likely to see some of these therapies approved in the next couple of years. Scientists are also exploring the use of gene therapy for more common diseases like heart failure, Parkinson's disease, as well as cancer. All this means that diseases with a genetic cause will disappear. Transplantation already has started, and if you remember, there was a patient in, uh, in uh, Europe that was... Uh, uh, that had a carcinoma of the trachea that was replaced with a trachea implant made from the stem cells of the patient. That patient is doing very well six years later. There is already an implantable kidney, which has been developed by the University of California in San Francisco and Virginia University, and that is advancing very rapidly as well. It filters the blood pressure, the 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 blood simply using the patient's blood pressure, and it has an indefinite lifespan. 3D printing is going to impact our lives very significantly. These are 3D printers, and the price of the cheapest 3D printers has come down from $18,000 to $400 within the last 10 years, and they are now 100 times faster, faster than they used to be. Stores in New York have opened for 3D printing. And in China, in 2014, they already built houses using 3D printing for a very uh, inexpensive uh, amount. They are already uh, print 3D printed organs, and that is happening at Wake Forest already, such as this ear that combines the biological and the electronic parts as well. And we have seen um, the, uh, the reproduction, if you wish, if you will, of the uh, ovaries and the production of hormone production using basically printed ovary, which restores the fertility in mice who have had their uterus and their ovaries removed. And they have had offspring with this uh, um, uh, 
uh, impact with this new method. Bryo engineer printed parts, body parts, has been done already in Duke University as far back as 2013, growing the, um, the vessels from the patient's own cells. Nike is 3D printing shoes, and you can see how the printed car of the future will look sometime in the years to come. So human tissue will be created with 3D printers and with the patient's own DNA. Why? Because that will require only a fraction of the cost of what happens now. It will be done in minutes and they can reproduce the patient's exact body shapes and this is being uh, uh, taken into other areas such as hearing aids, contact lenses, prosthetics, and so on. So it is projected and predicted that by the year 2027, mostly everything that is being produced will be 3D printed, about 10% of that. This is, a sh this is to show you how a 3D printer sh uh, works. Let me show you this. It's not just one or the other material, it's also uh, it's, it's using this this uh, gradient mixing uh, feature. And the question that we have to ask ourselves is, what will happen to manufacturing jobs? And it is a question that society will have to answer. Prosthetics are becoming the norm and they will be the norm very soon and that is done with 3D printing. And this is to show you how a sophisticated prosthetic leg can work. Let me show you this. And I want to tell you a few words about the future. As John Maynard Keynes said, the difficulty lies not in the new ideas, but in escaping from the old ones. So we already have human organs on chips, which will allow us to do clinical trials quite a bit differently than the way we do them now. We have already the possibility of seeing sensors that will provide information from a single drop of blood, and that is coming up any time. A, a biocompatible contact lens with LEDs will be available in the next short years. And there are many who predict that this will become a bionic eye, which will allow us to see infrared, night vision, telescopic vision, and so on and so forth. Cancer nanotechnology will be produced because this has already happened with outstanding results in mice where nanoparticle generators have been able to produce drugs that reach the cancer cell without being attacked by the immune system and destroy the cancer cell in that manner. Gene therapy for deafness has already been accomplished, repairing the gene that is defective, and this happens in a very small percentage of patients, by the way. There is already graphene-based artificial redness that are being developed that will be very close, very soon implanted in patients that are blind. What is graphene is the thinnest material on earth, which is one carbon atom thick. It is 200 times stronger than steel. It is more conductive than copper, is stretchable, is flexible, and it is transparent, and the ones that discover graphene for these uses have won the Nobel Prize of Physics in 2010. The computers that we are using are going to change significantly, and it is predicted that by the year 2023, 2025, we will see computers where with an unimaginable power The uh, brain, the reversal 
engineering of the brain will allow us to do away with specific phobias removed from many patients. Select memories can be erased and will be erased, leaving the rest of our memory intact. Implants to treat mental illness with deep brain stimulation will be no the norm, and that is going to happen in this next decade. Memory implants are going to be possible as well in the next decade, and this is because we are deciphering the code by which the brain forms long-term memories, which will be a strategy to treat dementia and traumatic brain injuries. Hodgkin's disease will be cured eventually in 2025-2028. We already are seeing the appearance of a medical lab on a nanochip which will analyze the disease versus using the full-scale laboratory that we use now. We will see electronic companies using holograms instead of the typical TV that you watch now. You will see holograms. Portable pancreas are around the corner. Stem cells injected into stroke patients are going to enable them to walk, and that has been done already in 2017 at Stanford in 18 patients. A, there are drugs already developed that reverse heart disease, and that has been done in mice in 2017 perhaps by the, 20, by the year 2025, 2026, we will be seeing something like this routinely. And this is done with a single dose of the drug. Miniature MRIs, reading dreams, has already been done. You see in the bottom, the reconstruction of the images seen during a dream, during a dream, during uh, brain activity, and that was done as far back as 2013. Google is developing a cancer and heart attack detecting pill, which is going to mon be monitored by a wrist-worn device. Breast cancer uh, survival rate in five years is approaching 100%. All of you remember perhaps a movie called Fast Fantastic Voyage in which the protagonists were traveling in the vascular system of the patient trying to dissolve a, a clot in the brain. Well, now we have tiny screw-shaped propellers that have been created that can move in a gel-like fluid. And this breakthrough will allow nanometer robots to enter cells and perform repairs or deliver drugs. And that is also something that might happen in the next decade. Robotic hands matching human capabilities are coming our way very rapidly. Brain implants to restore lost memories are going to happen at the end of the next decade. What about bariatric surgery? Will it disappear? There is already work done on GDF15, which is a bioengineered protein, meaning printed protein, that has allowed mice to lose 20% of their weight and, uh, in about 35 days because it turns off reward-driven eaten, eating. Maglev trains, the future of transportation. Maglev means magnetic levitation. These trains are capable of running at 2,500 miles per hour. The meat industry will be a mature industry by the year 2030. That means, that means that animals will not have to be slaughtered to get meat. And this hamburger that you see here has already been obtained in that manner. The animal is, uh, some of the cells from whatever place of the animal's body uh, you are interested are extracted and then the meat is reproduced in the laboratory. And there is no difference in the taste. Stem cell pharmacies will be commonplace. The, the possibility of curing uh, kidney cancer are approaching 100% by the year 
2033-2035. Reading minds is going to be possible, and that might be a way to treat patients that are living with sensory de deficits. Alzheimer's disease will be fully curable, and I want to show you this movie that shows you what happens when an antibody uh, is given to uh, animals that are, or patients that have the disease. The trial showed that the drug was having a remarkable impact on the brains of people with Alzheimer's. The scan on the right shows just how effective the drug has been in removing amyloid plaque from the brain. So the disappearance of the amyloid basically is what allows Alzheimer's to be cured. Hepatitis C will very likely disappear by the year 2036. And at some point in the future, we will have a biorepository of genomic information for a variety of reasons. And that means that we will have a genetic sample of every person on Earth. We will see miniature MRI scanners. We will see survival rates for leukemia approaching 100% by the year maybe 2040. Robots are now given emotion, and there will be a common feature of homes and workplaces. That means that patients that need care at home will have a robot with emotion that will take care of them 24-7. What about computational power? Can it match the human brain? There are many who are predicting that by the year 2030, computational power will be equal to that of one human brain. And they are saying at the same time that by the year 2045 or 2055, the computational power will be equal to all human brains. That will create a significant problem for humanity because we will be at a crossroads. And the reason is that social change takes uh, a lot, has a lag time compared with the advances of technology. And that is a problem that society will have to solve. Education will be transformed because basically at some point books will not be anymore the main element that people use to study. Virtual reality will be. Longevity treatments might be halted by the year 2065 or 2070. That is not known, but is predicted. The US population will reach half a billion by the year 2069. Advanced nanotech clothing will be common in the year 2072. And the first space elevator that is already being created will be functional and operational in the year 2075, perhaps in the year 2080. The end of the century will see hyper-intelligent computers. And what we will see also is a significant decrease in the number of hours that we work every week. So it is predicted that by the year 2090 or the year 2100, the work week will be 20 hours only. And there are predictions that say that by the beginning of the next century, we will see mind uploading entering mainstream society without altering the original personality of the person that is uploading his mind into a robot. And I am mentioning to you Nabi Tajima, who is a Japanese woman, woman that in the year 2018, in February of 2018, was 117 years old. And I'm saying this because it is predicted that by the year 2150, we will see the first humans that will reach age 
150 or older. And to conclude, I want to let you hear what Ray Kurzweil says about the future of the human species. Well, we're going to become increasingly non-biological to the point where the non-biological part predominates and the biological part is not that important anymore. In addition to radical life extension, we're going to have radical life expansion. So to end this discussion, I would like to remind you that technology can fail. Thank you very much for your attention.